If you've invested yourself in the casual study of Middle-earth lore, you've definitely heard the term Maiar being thrown around. It's probably in the same sentence as wizards, or Balrogs, or Sauron. And while none of those associations are incorrect, the full story goes much deeper. I'm Jess, part-time hobbit, and whether you know a few tidbits about the Maiar, or you clicked on this video out of sheer confusion, today I'm going to talk to you all about these mysterious wizardy spirits, what they are, who they are, and why they're so important. So let's start with the most important question, what are the Maiar? For that, we have to go back to the very beginning. Now I am going to try and be as concise as possible here, so bear with me, but in the Silmarillion, Tolkien tells us about the one big guy god named Eru Iluvatar. Eru Iluvatar is the first thing that ever existed, before even time and space was created. Of course, that's a pretty boring way to live, so Eru Iluvatar created a whole slew of spirits collectively known as the Ainur. The Ainur were all different aspects of his thought and spirit, and each had a unique personality, power, and wisdom. And the Ainur all got together and sang a beautiful song called the Song of the Ainur. And that song manifested itself in the creation of the physical world. Once they had the whole of Middle-earth to look down on, the Ainur were given a choice. They could stay outside of the world forever with Edu Iluvatar, or they could enter into the physical world and become part of the story that was about to unfold. Many of the Ainur stayed with Edu Iluvatar, but those that went into Middle-earth are divided into two categories. First off, the more powerful spirits are known as the 14 Valar. They're a bit like Tolkien's version of a pagan pantheon of gods, each with their own special abilities and powers, but there's a lot more to it than that. I actually did one of the videos in this series on the Valar a couple weeks ago, so if you want to brush up on what their whole deal is, uh, feel free to check that out. Accompanying the Valar were the less powerful Maiar. Maiar are immortal spirits whose name comes from the elvish word for excellent or admirable. Tolkien calls them servants and helpers to the Valar. And much like angels in the context of the Christian faith, the Maiar often act as intermediaries, these intercessors between the all-powerful Valar and the free people of Middle-earth. The actual abilities of the Maiar remain kind of ambiguous, but many of them developed skills similar to that of the Valar that they served. They also have some ability to manipulate the created world around them, because they, you know, helped make the created world around them, but Tolkien really wasn't interested in establishing hard lines for their magical capacity. Unlike the Valar, which rarely and generally temporarily actually existed in a real and physical form, the Maiar often had one body that they wore for most of their time walking Middle-earth. Technically speaking, there is an unknown and potentially infinite number of Maiar, but today we're just going to be talking through the ones that Tolkien named. You may also note that I'm skipping over all of the Maiar that turn to the dark side, like the Balrogs and our pal Sauron. And that's because I'm saving all the bad guys for a later video in this series, so if that makes you really mad, uh, that means you have to subscribe so you can catch that video when it comes out. Let's start with one of the chiefs of the Maiar, Aonwe, the Herald of Manwe. His role as the chief of the Maiar kind of feels like a prime example of nepotism, since the Valar that he served, Manwe, is also the chief of the Valar. But Tolkien also writes that Aonwe's might in arms is surpassed by none in Arda, so I guess he earned it. Aonwe is a bit of a golden boy, and he's even chosen to lead the armies of the Valar against Morgoth at the end of the First Age. He bears the banner of Manwe, and Tolkien gives us this absolutely awe-inspiring description of the scene. The challenge of the trumpets of Aonwe filled the sky, and Beleriand was ablaze with the glory of their arms. For the host of the Valar were arrayed in forms young and fair and terrible, and the mountains rang beneath their feet." So yeah, I guess he is pretty cool. Aonwe was even trusted enough to hold on to the Silmarils. You know, the, uh, the big shiny rocks that were so shiny that they caused genocide, and constantly deferred to the superior judgment of Manwe. After Sauron was defeated, he was even approached by Sauron, who 
threw himself at Aonwe's feet, begging for forgiveness. But Aonwe recognized that he didn't possess that power, and instead encouraged him to seek Manwe's judgment directly. Aonwe also helped the men of Numenor at the end of the Second Age, giving them knowledge, wisdom, and a long life. His mirror image is the other chief of the Valar, Ilmare. Though less is written about her, she is the handmaiden of Manwe's spouse, Varda. Varda is the serene and wise Valar, who's the essence of starlight itself. And Ilmare reflects this with her name, which means starlight. To me, Ilmare kind of seems like the cool and collected counterpart to Aonwe's brassy and righteous confidence. Interestingly, Ilmare and Eonwe were originally meant to be siblings, the children of Manwe and Varda, but this was later written out. In earlier drafts, many of the Maiar were actual offspring of the Valar, but for reasons that we're not entirely sure of, the idea was almost completely nixed, leaving the Maiar as completely separate and unrelated familially to the Valar. Underneath the chiefs of the Maiar are the servants of Ulmo, beginning with Ose. Ulmo is the Valar that dwells in the, the deep, dark depths of the sea, but Ose is very fond of the coasts and every place where the sea meets the land. He does not go in the deeps, but loves the coasts and the isles, and rejoices in the winds of Manwe, for in storm he delights and laughs amid the roaring of the waves. Ose cares deeply for the free people of Middle-earth, especially the Teleri elves. He befriends them and later instructs them, sat upon a rock near the margin of the land, and of him they learned all manner of sea lore and sea music. Ose is one of the less wise and more self-possessed Maya. In fact, in the beginning, he was tempted by Morgoth, the source of evil within Middle-earth. Morgoth promised Ose that he could make him more powerful than Ulmo, and Ose believed this deceit. It was only the help of the Maya Uinen, Ose's spouse, that was able to bring him to reckoning. Still, his fearsome temperament is often expressed through his love of violence and storms. Ose represents what is unpredictable, terrifying, and glorious about the open sea, and those who dwell by the sea or go in ships may love him, but they do not trust him. But for those who wish to trust the sea, we go to Uinen, his wife and counterpart. She's connected to all the water of Middle-earth, her hair laying sprawled out across every river, lake, stream, and pond. All creatures she loves that live in the salt streams and all weeds that grow there. To her, mariners cry, for she can lay calm upon the waves, restraining the wildness of Ose. In the Second Age, the Numenorians revere her as if she was a Valar herself for her ability to placate stormy seas. Still, Oenen has great power beyond this, and when her beloved Teleri elves are slain in the kinslaying, her grief and rage manifest in a great swelling of waves that sink many of the ships that have been stolen. Oenen represents the power of the calm sea. Not that of rage or unbound passion, but of slow, growing, all-encompassing waves. It is a graceful and subdued power, but no less awe-inspiring. The third Maya associated with the sea and Ulmo is Salmar. He is only known as the servant of Ulmo that crafted the Ulumuri. The Ulumuri are the great horns of Ulmo, crafted from white conch shells. They will be blown when Ulmo left the deep, speeding towards the shores of Middle-earth, and their sweet and resonant sound was said to be entirely unforgettable leaving any of those who heard it with an unquenchable longing for the sea. But looking up from the depths to the heavens, we find Arian. Arian was a servant of Vana, the Valar that held all of the flowers and animals in her power. On the green shores of Valinor, Arian tended to Vana's gardens using the dew she gathered from Laurelin. Laurelin was one of the two trees of Valinor, the massive, burning, enchanted lights that left all the land in a state of perpetual day. These trees would be destroyed by the powers of evil, and the Valar were left searching for something to replace them. They trapped the last light of Laurelin in a lamp and asked Arian to be the one who bore it through the sky, since she had often worked closely with the tree and had been unharmed by its heat. Delighted by this duty, Arian shed her physical form entirely, becoming too brightly glowing for even the Valar to 
look at her. She was as a naked flame, terrible in the fullness of her splendor. Meanwhile, Tilian was a rider with the hunting valor, Orome. Tilian bore a silver bow, but spent every moment that he wasn't hunting in Valinor under the light of the silver tree, Telperion. When the trees were destroyed, Tilian begged for the job of guiding the last light of Telperion, the moon, across the sky. This was due to his love of the silver tree, but also his desire to be with Arian. This fascination would often lead to Tilian behaving recklessly with the moon, traveling too close to the sun, and burning himself. This is Tolkien's mythic explanation for those moments when the moon is showing in broad daylight and eclipses. The lighting here is not, um, ideal. I don't know what to do. I'm so sorry, y'all. But not all of the Maya lived remotely, and some chose to involve themselves deeply in the affairs of Middle-earth. Melian was the servant of Vana, the Valar of flowers, and Este, the Valar with immense healing powers. Melian was beloved by all animals and birds, but nightingales loved her best, and they learned their beautiful song from her. Tolkien writes that even among the great and powerful spirits of the Valar in Valinor, there was none more beautiful than Melian, nor more wise, nor more skilled in songs of enchantment. She, more than any of the other Maiar I've mentioned, chose to set down roots in Middle-earth itself, leaving the gardens of Valinor for the vast trees of Middle-earth. She filled the silence of Middle-earth before the dawn with her voice and the voices of her birds. The Lord of the Teleri Elves, Elwë, was wandering through the forests of Middle-earth when he was enchanted by the song of Melian and her nightingales. He was so entranced that he forgot utterly all his people and the purposes of his mind, but he came at last to a glade open to the stars, and there Melian stood. She spoke no word, but being filled with love, Elwë came to her and took her hand, and straight away a spell was laid on them, so that they stood thus, while long years were measured by the wheeling stars above them, and the trees of Nan Elmoth grew tall and dark before they spoke any word. Of course, you can't generally stand in the wood for, you know, centuries without somebody knowing that you're gone, so a number of elves stayed behind to look for him. When Melian and Elwë finally snapped out of their trance, they gathered these wandering elves together and formed a kingdom in what would then be known as Beleriand. From her new kingdom, Melian goes on to perform many marvels, including repelling the primordially evil spider beast Ungoliant, guarding the land of Doriath with her enchantments, and teaching Galadriel the skill of making Lembus bread. I am bioluminescent. I don't know what to do. I've changed positions. Melian's story is very interesting because she's the only Maya to fall in love with and have a child with a creature of Middle Earth. Their child Luthien, being half Maya and half elf, is known as one of the most beautiful and powerful beings in Middle-earth, and Melian is an essential voice of wisdom and foresight in Luthien's complex tale. Luthien would go on to bear a child of her own, and her Maya blood would be passed down to the likes of Elrond and Arwen. I don't know precisely why Melian was the only Maya to have her own children, but I think it is worth noting that her daughter, Luthien, is the character that Tolkien most closely associated with his beloved wife, Edith. So maybe it makes sense that he should make the exception for Luthien to be half-goddess. But Melian wasn't the only Maya to fully involve herself in the affairs of Middle-earth. In fact, the subgroup of Maya, known as the Istari, are defined by that very fact. The Istari were established in the Third Age, when the Valar realized that Sauron, who was Amaya himself was gathering power and influence in Middle-earth. The Valar didn't want to physically intervene themselves, what with most of their battles ending in the land being razed to the ground and having to be born entirely anew due to their awe-inspiring, world-shaking power, so they got their best guys on the job to send in instead. The Istadi were ordered not to dominate the people of Middle-earth, and never to use the full breadth of their magical power, lest they interfere too much with the free people of Middle-earth. Instead, the Istadi were sent down to guide and lead, allowing the people to mount their own defense against Sauron. The exact order that they were sent down in gets a little bit muddled, so let's just first talk about the lesser known but incredibly cool 
Palando, and Alatar. They were good friends back in Valinor, and they physically manifested in Middle-earth as old men in sky-blue robes. They would hence be known as the Blue Wizards. Unfortunately, these two would head east to start gathering a defense against Sauron, and simply never returned. My, my friend the other day was asking me, you know, where are the other two wizards? Among questions like what happened to the Entwives, and she was less than pleased when I informed her that... Nah. Anyway, that brings us to the other three Isari, whose stories kind of have to be told together. Kurumo was the most confident of the three, and had once been a servant of Aule, the smith and maker of the Valar. And then there was Iwendu, who was a very gentle spirit, and was a servant of Yavanna, the Valar responsible for all of nature and growing life. And lastly, Olorin was known to be both gentle and wise, having spent a great deal of time in the presence of the Valar Nienna. Nienna was the Valar that constantly wept and mourned for all of the pain and loss of the world, and from her, Alorin grew to profoundly understand grief and pity. It was said that those who listened to him awoke from despair and put away the imaginations of darkness. Now, knowing a little about them, it may not surprise you that Kurumo was the only one out of the three that was fully ready and raring to throw himself into the fray and begin leading the people of Middle-earth. He volunteered readily, and was more than a bit put out when the Valar insisted that Alorin follow closely on his heels. Alorin tried to refuse at first, saying that he was too afraid of Sauron and not powerful enough to face him, but the Valar insisted that he go if only for the reason of facing that fear. To add insult to injury, Kurumo was also forced to bring along gentle-hearted Iwendio, and this kind of growing resentment that he held for the two of them was never truly forgotten. It didn't help that when the three arrived, they were greeted by Círdan, the shipwright. He met all of the Ishtari and chose to give Olorin the elven ring of power, Narya. He could see Olorin's wisdom and humility, and thought that he would be the best one to bear that ring of power. Kurumo took careful note of this, and his spirit slowly began to stray more and more towards hunger and greed. Kurumo would come to be known as Saruman, a name which means cunning man. And after wandering the east for centuries, he found his way back west, settling down in Isengard. As the leader of the Isari, he chose to wear robes of white, denoting his apparent wisdom and control. Iwendil found his own way as well, using his love of the natural world to care for the animals and plants of Middle-earth. He dwelt deep in the heart of the forests of Middle-earth, and would come to be known as Radagast, a name which means tamer of beasts. Radagast clothed himself in brown, likely to match his beloved trees and animals, and was thus known as the Brown Wizard. Alorin, however, never found a permanent home for himself. For many centuries, he moved about in disguise, becoming acquainted with the men and elves of Middle-earth, known only for his distinct grey garb. From the elves, he earned the title Mithrandir, which means the Grey Pilgrim, but the men chose to call him Gandalf. Later on, Gandalf's wandering brought him to the Shire, where he became closely acquainted with hobbits, who he admired for their steadfast and hardy strength. It was his connection to both the dwarves, the hobbits, and the world at large that led him to being involved in the whole, you know, hobbit business. If you're referring to the incident with the dragon, I was barely involved. In the grand scope of Middle-earth, though, the wizards could see that the power of Saruman was beginning to grow, and in order to combat this, they established the White Council, where Gandalf, Saruman, Elrond, and Galadriel could all meet together and plan. Galadriel, a close friend of Gandalf's, had first insisted that he lead the council, but when Gandalf turned that down, Saruman took leadership instead. This only served to set Saruman further at odds with Gandalf and the rest of the council. Saruman began to carefully manipulate the will of the council, leading to Sauron amassing power and establishing himself in Mordor. What the council hadn't realized was that in the halls of his tower, Orthanc, 
Saruman had stumbled across a Palantir. The Palantir was one of eight immensely powerful seeing stones originally used by the Dúnedain to communicate over the many vast miles of Middle-earth. The Palantir allowed Saruman direct communication to Sauron, and this caused his festering wound of resentment to blossom into a full-blown infection. Saruman had always been mechanically minded due to his connection to the Valar Aule, but now he turned these skills towards wickedness. He began to disregard nature, forging weapons and armor, and in the rancid pits of his new workshops, he began to create an army. This army consisted of men and orcs, as well as these super orcs known as Urukai, which he bred to be ruthlessly obedient killing machines. Saruman placed his human servant Wormtongue in the heart of the horse kingdom of Rohan, and began orchestrating careful attacks on Rohan's border. He began chewing at Middle-earth from the inside out, convinced that he could someday rival the power of Sauron. Though Sauron feigned obedience to the Dark Lord, in truth, he never wanted to truly become subservient, instead thinking that he would be able to snatch the power of the ring for himself. I can't help but think that this desire for the ring's power may somehow be linked to Saruman's connection to Aule. Because, fun fact, Sauron was also once a Maya who was a servant to Aule before he turned to evil. Aule himself doesn't even exactly have the best track record. He pretty much jumped the gun of creation, deciding to make the dwarves himself because he wanted someone to teach his skills to. Edu Iluvatar was, I think, understandably upset since he had planned on having the elves be the first creatures to be created, but Aule was able to humble himself and even offered to destroy the dwarves with his own hands, leaving him, you know, righteous and good. However, this desire to create and to some degree control must have been passed down to his protégés Saruman and Sauron, leaving them ripe for corruption. However, the corruption of Saruman couldn't be hidden forever, and just as Gandalf was beginning to worry about getting the ring out of the Shire, Saruman decided to set a trap for him. And of course, he asked Radagast for help in bringing Gandalf to his door. Radagast, who had always been far too kind and trusting for his own good, believed Saruman's change of heart, and told Gandalf that the White Wizard wanted to help him on his quest to save Middle-earth. With Gandalf in his grasp, Saruman reveals that he is no longer Saruman the White. Gandalf later says, I looked then, and saw that his robes, which had seemed white, were not so, but were woven of all colors, and if he moved, they shimmered and changed hue, so that the eye was bewildered. White, Saruman claimed, was far too simple of a color for a man of his power. White cloth or paper, he argues, could be dyed or overwritten. Saruman plans to encompass all the powers of the world at once, though, and he tries to sway Gandalf to his side, saying, we must have power, power to order all things as we will, for that good which only the wise can see. Saruman has clearly forsaken the vow that he first made when he entered Middle-earth, but now, influenced by Sauron and his own proclivity towards lust and greed, he has broken that promise entirely. Gandalf, however, will not be seduced by these dark powers. And Saruman flies into a rage, deciding that if Gandalf will not help him, he's going to have to be kept out of the way. But Gandalf, with the help of Radagast, manages to escape Sauron's clutches and goes on to lead the Fellowship of the Ring. I think this is a particularly pertinent point when we take into account that he earlier refused to lead the White Council out of fear. It's only when he's confronted by Saruman's betrayal and the loss of him as a friend that he feels confident enough to step into that role. Unfortunately, Gandalf's leadership was not destined to last long. After being chased into the dwarven mountain halls by Saruman's magic, Gandalf comes face to face with a Balrog. The Balrog of Moria is technically a Maya, on par with Gandalf's power, but he sets aside his fear and faces it head on. Gandalf tells the creature, I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Anor. Go back to the shadow. This confrontation ends with both Gandalf and the Balrog plummeting into the depths of the earth 
torn apart by water and fire. The physical form that Gandalf has dwelt in for centuries is torn to pieces, and his spirit is left drifting and moreless. He later says, I strayed out of thought and time, and I wandered far on roads that I will not tell. However, the Valar recognize that this is not to be his end. Instead, they clothe him in new flesh and send him back, giving him the role of white wizard that Saruman had once held. Gandalf finds the remnants of the Fellowship and tells them that he was Gandalf, but now he has become Saruman as he should have been. Gandalf's fear and powerlessness have been crystallized, turned into a humble and graceful sort of leadership, far superior to Saruman's confidence and fierceness. With Gandalf the White on the scene, the bricks of Saruman's tower of selfishness begin to crumble. He mounts an attack on the citizens of Rohan at Helm's Deep, but with Gandalf's help he is utterly defeated. The Ents, as a manifestation of nature, also rise up, literally tearing apart Orthanc piece by piece. Finally, when he's left with a shell of his former power, Gandalf confronts him, and drawing on the pity that he once learned from Nienna, Gandalf offers Saruman mercy. He offers that Saruman turn to a new path and try once again to fulfill the purpose that he was sent down for. For a very brief moment, Saruman's face betrays the maelstrom of anguish and regret that he's feeling, but just as quickly, he turns back to malice and greed and scoffs at Gandalf's offer. This is the final denial of his great purpose, and for this Gandalf casts him out of the Order of Istari and destroys his staff, rendering him powerless. Rather than killing him though, he leaves Saruman on his own, humiliated and practically alone. Gandalf goes on to struggle greatly, but succeeds in his goal. And with Gandalf's guidance and aid, Frodo is able to destroy the ring, rendering the power of Sauron at last eliminated from Middle-earth. Saruman, meanwhile, really could not have fallen further. The hobbits return to the Shire when all is done, discovering that Saruman has exerted the meager remains of his power onto the Shire. He's been going under the pseudonym Sharky and has tried to industrialize the Shire like he once did Orthanc. The returning Hobbit heroes immediately recognize this as unacceptable and set about banishing him from the Shire once and for all. It isn't long before the formerly great white wizard is at their mercy, but having learned well from Gandalf, Frodo offers him pity, once again sending him off with his life. Wormtongue, who has pathetically followed Saruman even in his defeat all the way to the Shire, slinks off after him. But Saruman cannot help but provoke the man one last time, probably desperate for some kind of a power trip after his utter humiliation. This mistake would prove fatal, prompting Wormtongue to leap on him and slit his throat before he's killed by an arrow. Saruman dies instantly, but to the dismay of those that stood by, about the body of Saruman, a grey mist gathered, and rising slowly to a height like smoke from a fire, as a pale shrouded figure, it loomed over the hill. For a moment it wavered, looking to the west. For a moment it wavered, looking to the west. But out of the west came a cold wind, and it bent away and with a sigh, dissolved into nothing. This is the final word of his story. Unlike Gandalf, who was given new flesh when he was killed, Saruman's spirit simply dissipates. He was left to wander powerless, formless, and alone for the rest of time. Radagast's fate is fairly ambiguous, as he likely just stayed in Middle-earth as his power began to dissipate, but Gandalf, who was the main orchestrator of their success, was given the greatest honor. He takes the last ship back to Valinor, able to dwell in his physical form in peace for the rest of time. I see the Maiar as the everyday magic in the world. Unlike the terrifying, earth-shattering, incomprehensible power of the Valar, the power of the Maya is in simple acts of nature and humanity. The power of the Maya is in storms and gentle seas. It's in the sun and the moon, in the songs of nightingales in trees, it's in falling in love. It's in wisdom and cruelty and knowledge and 
friendship. They're Tolkien's way of telling us to open our eyes and look at the magic that's always around us. That's gonna bring us to the end of this video. I really hope you guys liked it. Taking the last two weeks off to move has made me acutely and distinctly aware of how much I really do enjoy making these videos, so I just want to say thank you for, you know, sticking around and watching my videos every week. If you don't watch my videos every week and you think you might want to, you should hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you can join me here every week. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it and comment your favorite Maya. Mine is probably Gandalf, which is a pretty popular choice, I feel, but let me know which one you were drawn to the most. Thank you all so much for watching, as always, and I hope that you all have a very happy, hobbity day. Thank you.